Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Wow, do spankings hurt? Hmm? At least from what I could tell that happened to my brother growing up, right? <laughs> no, I know myself. Thankfully, I know. And thankfully, you know too. A father and mother's discipline. And you know a heavenly father's discipline from the suffering that happens in our life. Those aren't things we actually don't want. We want to know that somebody cares enough to love us to steer us on the right way. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be here today. That tough stuff, suffering and discipline, whether it's from parents or from our Heavenly Father, is what we talk about today in our lessons and especially from Pastor Paul's devotion about fire and the struggle of families and relationships that come on this earth. Jeremiah 23, Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I have a dream, I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their fathers forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? This is God's word from the Old Testament for our consideration. Sometimes mom and dad had to treat us how we were acting, like a kid. And they had to discipline us, like what we talked about in the introduction to the service. And thank God they did that. Thank God they did what was tough for us because they kept us on the right track and they did what their Heavenly Father wanted them to do. They kept our eyes focused on Jesus and not on doing what we wanted to do. We read from Hebrews 12, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted the, to the point of shedding your blood and you've forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? 
if you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. In our verse of the day, Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Alleluia. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you loyal to him, your loyal Savior. Amen. We read the gospel lesson again this summer, reading many things from the, uh, the gospel of Luke, chapter 12, the last verses, beginning at 49. Jesus said, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. This is the gospel for our consideration. Please be seated. In the name of Jesus, their fellow redeemed by him. Would you consider yourself to be brand loyal? By that we mean that you regard a certain brand of product, a certain store, a certain service provider to be superior to his or its competitors so that you would, by buying those products and staying loyal to a certain brand, that you would feel that that's the way to live the good life, to do things right for your life. Are you brand loyal? Do you stick to buying this certain name brand product as opposed to the generic? Or to go to this particular service provider or that particular store for that particular product? Are you committed to that? If you are, then you understand brand loyalty. And if you do, then you say, and, and I truly believe that I benefit from that. By sticking to what I believe in, I, I benefit. But at the same time, you realize this may come at a price. In order to stick to a certain brand or go to a certain store, or stick with a certain service provider, it may cost you more. If 
financially. Or it may cost you more in time or in distance. You may have to drive more miles. But you say, the benefits are worth the price. Now, maybe you're not that way. Maybe when you go uh, shopping, you say, hey, whatever's on sale. Or, hey, it doesn't matter, the, the, the national brand or the generic, I don't care. Or um, service provider, whether it's carpet cleaner or medical doctor, whichever one's available first, doesn't matter. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it does. Especially if your life depends on it, right? Then you want the best available. Then there may be only one that can save your life. Then brand loyalty develops quickly. Today's gospel lesson, our Lord Jesus talks about his loyalty to a plan, his loyalty to his Father, his loyalty to you and me and the world. We want to look at the benefits of that loyalty. We want to understand the price. And we use it to measure our own loyalty to Christ as well. Our Lord Jesus was a loyal son of his heavenly father. He was loyal in an unflinching way. The Bible speaks of that loyalty in Psalm 45, repeated in Hebrews. It says where the Lord Jesus, through the prophet, even before he was born as Jesus, the Son of God said, I have come to do your will, O Father. Well, that's loyalty. How many fathers out here wouldn't like to have their sons say, Father, I have come to do your will. When Jesus was 12 years old, first trip to Jerusalem, his parents lost track of him, spent three days looking for him. And he was dumbfounded. When they found him, he said, them, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? At the age of 30, when he entered his public ministry, standing in the Jordan River to be baptized by John, John said, I don't need to baptize you. You're not even sinful. And Jesus said, John, it's okay. Do it. I have come to fulfill all righteousness, to do everything right. Do it. He was loyal to the plan of salvation. And that loyalty was tested to the extreme. He said, I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is completed. That baptism was not the water baptism in the Jordan River, but it's a figurative term when he would be immersed in the agony of the cross, baptized with that anguish that he bore as our substitute. Oh, he was distressed by it. Make no mistake, he was a true human being. How distressed I am until this is done. He spoke these words just weeks before he would undergo it. And we hear words expressing that in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, Father, if there's another way to do what I have to do, if there's another way that I can reconcile sinful mankind to you, their Holy Father, if there's some other way, Lord, let me see it now. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He was unflinchingly loyal to the plan. Till it was done. On the cross, he said so. It is finished. And the resurrection is the seal that our Lord Jesus was loyal, unflinchingly so, undividedly so, perfectly so, loyal to the plan to win, rescue and forgiveness and salvation and eternal life for sinful mankind. 
He accomplished it. His loyalty to the Father had its benefit, though it cost him dearly at a price. The price of his lifeblood shed in agony and suffering under the burden of the sins of the world. Why did Jesus do it? Why was he loyal? Maybe you know some people. Maybe you found yourself a victim of blind loyalty. People were loyal to something without realizing fully what they were getting into. Maybe, maybe you've been duped into loyalty towards someone or something, and you thought, this is the right thing for me, and only to find out it was a scam in the end, or that their promises didn't deliver. Our Lord Jesus went not into blind loyalty when he came into this world, but calculated loyalty. It was a loyalty that was definitely focused on sacrifice. He knew what he had to undergo. But it was a loyalty anchored in love, love for you, love for me, love for any and every sinner. Because he knew that only through his loyal service would we have salvation. Today we thank our Lord Jesus that he underwent that baptism of the anguish of the cross. Because what it did is it brought fire on the earth, as he said. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. When Jesus completed his mission, when he had paid for the sins of the world and risen from the dead, he kindled the fire of the gospel into the world. The good news, the, the message of life and forgiveness and hope and peace with God through faith in him. And that fire still burns. It burns in your heart. It was the fire that burned in the heart of the Emmaus disciples when they said, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us by the way and opened the scriptures to us? Yes, as you and I open the scriptures, we are again uh, warmed by the, by the fire of the gospel. And our hope and our love for Christ and our trust in him are rekindled anew each time. And that loyal Savior. What does it mean that Jesus was loyal to the Father? Again, clearly, it means that you and I have a Savior. And how important that is. Because we measure it against our own spiritual loyalty. Or maybe we should say disloyalty. How many times hasn't our loyalty to Christ been tested and found wanting? How many times have we made choices that led us away from Christ, or at least said to Christ, you're no big thing, you're a generic savior to me. I can take you or I can leave you because I know you love me, and because you love me, you'll never forsake me, so I can come back to you when I want to. So just let me have it my way. Nevertheless, Jesus, not your will, but mine be done. When we examine our own hearts, our deeper inner thoughts, honestly, we find too often chances or, or situations, issues, where, where that's been our approach. Loyal to Christ, Lord, forgive us for our disloyalties. But Jesus said, when we grasp the, the loyalty that he showed for us, for our salvation, um, it has an effect. And that effect, he said, is not what we expect, I think. He said, do you think I, ca I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. Don't misunderstand. Through Jesus, we have peace in our hearts, inner peace, the forgiveness of sins, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's not referring to that. He's referring to the, the peace, the relationship between people based on their loyalty or antagonism toward Christ. Because, quite simply, the fire of the gospel does not kindle faith in everyone's hearts. 
even as it kindles loyalty toward Christ in you and me, it kindles antagonism toward him in those who do not believe. They find the message of the cross an offense to their pride, to their works, to their virtues, to their self. And so there is division, not peace. You know, you and I live and work among so many Christians. We worship with people who believe what we believe, know what we know, trust what we trust, that it's not division here. It's unity. And oh, how we cherish that unity. But we know that out in the world, yes, even in the Chippewa Valley, we run into this division where we and when we stand up for our Lord Jesus, when we are loyal to his word and his truth, we even in our world, in our society, in our communities, we even find it here that there is this division. Sometimes it even creeps within the most intimate relationships of all, the relationship of the family, where it divides parents and children. Boy, can that be? But so strong is the power of the gospel for Christ, and so strong does the devil work against Christ and loyalty to him, that yes, even in families, it can show up. Jesus said these words to warn us, to say, hey, be alert, be strong, because it will come, it can come into any family. If in your family you have this wonderful unity in the gospel, cherish it, cultivate it, foster it, and rejoice and enjoy, uh, in it and enjoy it. As we in our congregation and our synod enjoy this kind of unity, it, it builds in us a sense of loyalty. Some people would say, you're loyal to your church because you grew up in it. Blind loyalty. I trust that's not true of any one of us. I trust that it is educated and calculated loyalty based upon the truths of God's word. I trust, too, that in our families, we continue to work to maintain that unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace through Christ and his word and forgiveness. You and I may be tempted, may be tempted not to always be so loyal to our Lord Jesus. May I remind you of the words of this one familiar hymn. Jesus, and shall it ever be a mortal man ashamed of thee? Ashamed of thee, whom angels praise, whose glories shine through endless days. Ashamed of Jesus, that dear friend on whom my hopes of heaven depend? No, when I blush, be this my shame that I no more revere his name. Ashamed of Jesus? Yes, I may, when I've no guilt to wash away, no tear to wipe, no good to crave, no fear to quell, no soul to save. Till then, nor is my boasting vain, till then I boast a Savior slain. And oh, may this my glory be, that Christ is not ashamed of me. The words of this text bring us back to the realities of living in this sin-filled world. Oh, how glad we are that our Lord Jesus came to it, and that in his unflinching loyalty, he paid for our sins, even though he underwent the immersion in the anguish of the penalty for those sins. May our Savior's loyalty to us inspire in us continuing and unflinching loyalty to him and his word. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which passes our understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. 
Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.